After three flyaways marking the first three races of the longest season in F1 history, the pinnacle of motorsport returns to Europe for the first time in 2022, back in Imola ahead of the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. It also marks the first of three F1 sprint events this year. And with a reshuffled grid and teams not expected to be bringing a huge amount of upgrades, can Ferrari continue their top form and extend their gap at the top? Will Red Bull continue to be blighted by reliability woes? Alex Albon and Williams stole a point in Melbourne last time out. Could they do it again this weekend? Well, the recording date is Monday, the 18th of April. And to discuss all things Imola, alongside myself, Harry Benjamin, I'm joined by F1 commentator for the likes of Channel 4 and the BBC, Ben Edwards. And I'm also pleased to say Sky Sports F1's Rachel Brooks joins us on the show too. Well, welcome, Ben. Welcome, Rachel. And especially grateful, of course. We're always grateful to have Ben, but grateful to have Rachel as well this week. Um, Nice to see you, Rachel. You've just sort of flown back from Melbourne. So, well, how was Melbourne and how have you seen the season so far? It's been a bit of a wild run. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I have just got back from Melbourne. We came via LA and we had a missed connection. So I had a night in LA as well. Um, So I eventually got home back to England. Um, But I, Australia was fantastic. It was incredible. The fans, I think that was the first time we've had a real sort of reset where we could see what this new Formula One is like and see what, uh, see the impact, I guess, of like Drive to Survive and this, the competition now, see what it's actually done. And it was incredible. And there is such a great atmosphere around it now and around the sport that I think it just lifted everybody. You know, jet lag didn't really exist for a while because there was such a good atmosphere at the track in Melbourne and and with the fans and the response everywhere has been phenomenal. So we had the first two races in the Middle East and they happened and it was exciting. And then you get to somewhere like, like Australia that's been deprived of it for two years and you feel the real impact of it. So, so far this season has been brilliant. We've had everything already we're only three races in I'm absolutely loving it yeah, that's the thing you have to keep reminding yourself isn't it only three races in still you know, 20 to go that's usually the normal length of a season isn't it so it's bizarre <laughs> to think like that um now a few of these sort of talking points uh, to, to come out of uh, the sort of week off what we've had Ben um if we dive straight into it shall we is this idea of uh B teams in Formula One and sort of having partnerships it's not a new thing is it we've seen it happen before sort of officially unofficially I mean even go back to sort of the Red Bull Torosa days when it was an identical car so the ideas have come about recently with the Haas and Ferrari tie-up being a little bit under scrutiny what have you made of it or are you in support of B teams or do you think actually no they should be all completely 10 independent teams and that ha- is that is how it should be it's a really difficult one, this, because I, I totally get it for teams like McLaren, who, you know, very much exist on their own. Uh, they want they want everyone to be in the same boat. Um, but it, you also understand the fact that a team like Red Bull working with Alpha Tauri, it makes a lot of sense. And, and it has kept the number of cars in Formula One. It's kept good teams together in Formula One that might have dropped out at different times. Formula One is developing. And I think from what Rachel says too, you know, it's fantastic that that fan support is is getting stronger and stronger. And in a way, perhaps that will lead to totally independent teams in the future being able to operate. I think we've been through a patch in Formula One where asking all these teams to be independent, there maybe wasn't the money and the backing to allow that. But now that we're talking, we will be talking about the likes of Porsche and Audi getting involved. Perhaps, actually, that is a route now to start thinking about that they are really are independent teams. I just don't think that Formula One's been in a strong enough position to, to do that until perhaps now. It's the old romantic in me wants the independence on the grid again. I mean, that some of those stories, Ben, were just phenomenal, weren't they, of the days of the independents scraping together to get a team to the track and and. Those are the things that F1 thrived on in the past. And I hate to lose that, but you can totally, like you say, see why teams like having a B team as such right now. Yeah, I agree. And I would love to see them independent, ultimately, I must admit. And and I do get the fact that, you know, McLaren getting upset that, that, that some of these teams will back their lead team, if you like, when they're voting for things with the FIA. Um, so I, I do get it. I would love to see them all fully independent, but are we re- you know let's let's get it there gradually i can't see it's all going to happen suddenly it's interesting though it's sort of mclaren i think andrea Seidel, one of the the team principals very firmly against this idea of sort of splitting and sharing of information but of course mclaren have been there before you go back not too long ago you know they had quite a bit of a relationship with force india though nothing was quite you know official there was very much you know upgrades were sort of talked about and information shared so it's classic formula one politics in play isn't it but what this does sort of 
introduced is this idea perhaps you, you mentioned Ben about Porsche and Audi coming into it and I also want to weave in a little bit um with reserve drivers as well and the fact that we've got so much uh young talent out there at the moment Ben with the likes of Oscar Piastri with Porsche and Audi coming in it's not expected that they're going to be launching their own new team they're going to sort of join alliances potentially with McLaren and Red Bull but is that really what we want to see? I mean, I personally prefer them to come in as, as teams as their own right, more teams, more seats, more personnel employed. That's beneficial for Formula One as a sport, no? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, the reserve driver thing, I would like to see them uh, getting opportunities to do sort of Friday practice more often, things like that. When when I used to do A1GP, that was one thing they did very well, I always felt, was bring young drivers in for an official practice session um, over a weekend and, and give them opportunities, which, which I would love to see in Formula One. I, I would like to see that happen more. Um, I think with the, the the teams, the involvement with the the, the teams, the independents, it, yeah, that is a bit of a mixture. I mean, there are engine suppliers, there are complete teams, so there there is a bit of a split. There always has been in Formula One that that bit of a mixture. I think. Um, so I, I I think we've got to sort of see how it goes. But it does seem odd to me, Porsche and Audi. It does feel a bit weird, you know, reading up about the what's the thoughts are going on there at the moment. The two of them coming in in Formula One, both with such amazing sports car backgrounds, uh, and yet both will be in competing against each other in slightly different formats. You know, I, I do find that slightly hard to get my head around at the moment. The interesting, I was reading up on this, the interesting thing for me was, um, obviously they both come under the VW brand. Porsche, from what I understand, are looking at more of a kind of a branding exercise, potentially with Red Bull. That's maybe closer than, than anything Audi might be doing. And Audi themselves actually coming in as a team and maybe buying a team with the likes of maybe Sauber or Alfa Romeo um, or even Aston Martin, which if they came in as an, own, as, their, as an independent, as another team and Porsche were kind of a branding exercise with Red Bull, you've got, that, the weird thing is you've got those two under the same roof, essentially, or under the same umbrella company. And yet, as you say, Ben, they're competing and then knowledge sharing and like you, you get a massive kind of mess here that needs untangling, doesn't it? Formula yeah. One, and you can understand the other teams looking at it going, hang on a minute, you two have the same parent company and you're telling us you're competing and you're not sharing information, but I mean, it's... it's Can we believe Yeah, you? it's, it's going to be incredibly difficult. You can see why teams are, are up against it. And then you also have the whole, how much concession do they get? They come into the sport, do they come in as a new manufacturer? Do they get allowances yeah. for that and the money and the concessions for that? Or do Red Bull suddenly say, we're a new manufacturer now because we're Red Bull Porsche? We get all that extra, those extra concessions again. We get all that dino time. We get, it's, it's such a tangled web. I don't envy anyone trying to undo it, to be honest. <laughs> no, that's right. To be working at the FIA at the moment and trying to uh, straighten all this out, it must be impossible. <laughs> but we want more manufacturers. It's brilliant for the sport, right? It's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And actually, I'd like to see more cars. I mean, I know there's an argument, you know, saying that 10 teams is enough and they keep saying that. I, I don't actually agree with that. I'd love to see, say, 12 or 13 teams to up to 26 cars. For me, I think when we saw grids like that before, it was it was very entertaining. What about three car teams? That that doesn't appeal to me quite so much. I don't know why. I suppose it's something because it's not something we've seen. Maybe maybe I'm just not uh, adaptable to something new like that. I would rather see more teams myself. I yeah I I agree with Ben. I don't I don't want to see three car teams. However, I'm going to throw a complete curveball into the mix. Oh go How on. About the reserve driver has to compete in the sprint. So one of the two seats in yeah. the sprint is taken yeah. by a reserve driver. Oh, yeah, I'd like to see and then, that. I and like then that. they get a race, they get a short, they get to experience it. You can actually see what talent they've got. They get a chance out on the grid. I, I'd quite like to see that. There's my curveball. It's a tricky one, though, isn't it? Imagine if, you know, Ferrari had to do that and they said, right, Carlos Sainz, you're now not doing the sprint race because we're getting in our, our reserve driver. He'd go ballistic, wouldn't he? I mean, you know, I've got to fight back. I've got to challenge Charles. How am I going to yeah, do Yeah, you've got to be careful, haven't you? Because then they lose the points, don't they, that they may need for a driver's yeah. championship. Yeah. So you've got to work it out as to how exactly. that equates. But um, maybe you get the reserve driver's points. I don't know. You've got to work something out to make it happen. But I'd quite like to see them get an actual yeah. chance to experience a race weekend properly. The whole idea of three car grids or sorry three car teams or a bigger grids as well throws up a a bigger issue i think because i'd love to see more cars more drivers in whatever capacity possible i'd like to go back to how it was in 2010 or when it that roughly era where you had those three extra teams hrt virgin and team lotus but rachel they weren't competitive and they never really became competitive either before eventually their demise so 
it brings us back to the B team scenario. Yes, it may not sit well with some people, but if it gives teams a fighting chance, you know, just look at Williams on their own. But even with this new funding that's come in at the end of last year, the fact we discussed Alex Alba performing heroics to get one point, you know, that's not what we want to see. That's not where a t- team like Williams should be, is it? So that, uh, that's my sort of case for having the B team, really. I can totally see that. I mean, you look at the the benefits that Haas get from from having that connection with Ferrari and and especially, you know, the Ferrari engine's great this year. Haas are performing well. You know, that that you're going you're going to see that and I don't think anybody would would begrudge Haas having a good season this season. Um so I I do get that and the situation with Williams it is a real shame. I mean, Jos Capito has said, you know, I'm, we've have to take risks. That's the only way we're going to score points. 57 laps on one set of hard tires, that's quite a risk, but it worked. It paid off. And those sort of stories are brilliant as well though. And we won't have them if you suddenly make them a B team. We won't have those moments where, you know, Alex walks into the pen with a, this just enormous grin on his face because he can't quite believe he's done it and he's got a point from absolutely nowhere. No one on Friday would have given Williams a chance of getting a point on Sunday. Let's be honest in Australia, no one would. So you're going to lose those elements if you go too much down the B team route, I, it's the old romantic, the same thing again. I like the thought of teams fighting like that Williams and coming back through. They will come back. I'm absolutely positive. They will come back one day. Don't know if it'll be the only ship that are there now, who knows, but they will, they'll be back up there one day. Well, and and also sort of on on Melbourne as well, actually good. We spoke about it off air, just picking up on some of the things that have fallen out from there as well. One of the teams we thought would do really well, Rachel McLaren, but, off the pace certainly in the first two races back on it in Albert Park and where we I think we all saw your your really good chat with Daniel who seemed as you said quite encouraged and positive about things but you know how track specific is Melbourne are we gonna is this a renewed is this a renewed McLaren now I mean it's difficult I, I made a joke with him because he was involved in some of the changes at Albert Park and he was at pains to tell me they started in 2019 because I said to him look you've removed a couple of slow corners out of Albert Park and your car doesn't like slow corners I'm just linking. He was like, no, no, no. We did the designs in 2019. It, it was nothing to do with that. But it's true. The McLaren doesn't like slow corners. And that's what the, those are the tracks where they're really struggling at the moment. So um, I think there was a step improvement in Albert Park, but there was also an element of track specifics. I don't know what you think, Ben, but I think I think they still have quite a few issues there that they want to iron out and need to iron out. Yeah, it doesn't look like it, I think. It's certainly not what how they were last year. You know, they were such a strong team. Got a podium last year at Imola. And I and I think getting a podium this time at Imola might be a challenge. Mind you, that both Daniel and and Lando have got pretty good records over the last couple of years at Imola. So we'll just have to see, I suppose. We will indeed. Well, it won't be long until we get to see what things await us in Imola and our return to Europe. Ben, uh, it's the first of the sprint race as well this weekend. So take us through the, the Imola track and your sort of thoughts on it, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Well, it, it's a good track. It's a lovely track. It's It's been part of Formula One since the early 1980s. Uh, and of course, it disappeared from Formula One for a while and then came back in, in 2020. And now it's going to be the uh, the third Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. Um, uh, there's a lot of history with the place. There's a lot of sadness, of course, with the uh, Senna accident in 1994. And we, we can never forget that. There's memorials to, to Senna there. But it's also provided some some good racing these last couple of years, I have to say. Max Verstappen hasn't qualified brilliantly well. He's qualified third both times. And yet he's taken the lead on both the previous races on the opening lap. So so it does open up things. We've had weather change, obviously, that very wet race, um, seeing Hamilton spin off into the gravel and still recover and come back to a good result. So actually, I'm looking forward to it. I think, I think there'll be a lot to enjoy. And of course, the guys that will really enjoy it are the Tifosi, the, the Italian Ferrari fans because they're going to be on home territory in a season where everything is going so superbly well for them um i think they're going to be super excited <laughs> careful got, you don't jinx it we've got a sprint and we've got rain forecast for the whole weekend as well i mean they couldn't throw much more into the mix for this one what do you think about the sprint rachel the first one of three this year they, they sort of rejigged it a little bit you got points now all the way down to eight did you see enough last year to to think it warranted more this year I think so eventually I don't want it at too many events so I think I think it's the right number but when you have someone like Kevin Magnuson saying there are points down to eighth now I can get points in this sprint race brilliant I think there'll be more drivers going for it now on a Saturday afternoon there will be more at st- well there is more at stake and I think it's going to make for some brilliant racing I mean 
I don't know if the teams are going to like it because I mean, they just want the cars in one piece to start the race on Sunday. But I, I, I actually am really enjoying them now. I'm, I'm, I'm used to them and I'm enjoying them. And I'm actually excited to see what evolves over a sprint weekend now. I like it. I think certainly as well, Ben, don't you think for, for fans, track side, actually, it gives, it gives you more to watch. You get more bang for your buck, essentially, don't you? Absolutely. You're seeing two races. And at the end of the day, races are races, aren't they? And, and you know, having or watching them at home, you know, qualifying on the Friday is always fun to watch. But then you get a race on Saturday afternoon, you get a race on Sunday. Uh, it, it is more, I think, for the fans and spectators to enjoy. So, yeah, you can argue it's not the, quite the old style, but I do think for the fans, for the spectators, for everyone getting into Formula One, there are a lot of positives about it. And let's not forget Silverstone and Monza were two of the most talked about races last yeah. year. They, both they had certainly were, weren't they? Well, now, Rachel, because you're new here, we, we normally do uh, some predictions uh, towards the end of each show. So I'm just going to give you a heads up because I'm not going to go there straight away. I'm going to ask you a harder question first. Well, maybe not harder, but just in terms of what are you hoping for this weekend? If there's one thing that you really want to see or keep an eye on, what would it be? Um, less porpoising all over the grid. I don't. I, I get it that, you know, some teams have got it right. Some designers have got it right and they're not suffering like others, but I don't want to talk about it anymore. And I want the team, the cars to all be performing at their best and let's really see who's got what. Um, and that to me, watching in Australia and watching the heads, the driver's heads bouncing as much as they were, I just, I'm watching it thinking, I don't even understand right now what you're having to deal with in that car. Um, if the car's slow without porpoising, then it's slow and you've got to work on it. But I just want to see, at the moment, I, I'm sick of talking about it and I really want everyone to solve it and it to go away. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, I'm afraid, because I think there are bigger issues at stake for the teams that are really struggling with it. But maybe this track might be slightly better off than they were in Australia. I don't know. Just 10 more questions on porpoising, if I may. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you're right. We, we have to talk, it's talk to death. But there's always something every year that you talk about for at least the first 10 races or whatever it is. But, and I don't uh, want to take it away from the ones who've got it right. You know, I don't want to take it away from the designers who've got it right. And, you know, and it's not happening to them. But but I just... Well, I, I mean, I, I, hate, I hate to follow up, but you say the designers that have got it right obviously mercedes it, porpoising is quite an issue on them but then you also look at ferrari especially in melbourne and they had a huge amount of the p yeah. word going on but they're fast and mercedes yeah. charles, charles just said i can deal with it it's, it's it's not a big deal i can i can cope with it and you've got a fast car so you can cope with it can't you so it, it can't find then for how much they can withstand to how much the team can it must be that. Well, it must be inherent. I think that identifies something within the Mercedes, doesn't it? That's inherently wrong in that design. But I, I clearly can't all be down to the porpoising then, perhaps. But let's draw a line under it. Let's leave it there. Okay. I, think, <laughs> I think what intrigues me, actually, when you talk about that, what intrigues me is, is are we going to see many, many modifications coming to the cars this weekend? Because I was told by, by an engineer that, oh, I, this was a while ago, I don't think there'll be many modifications at Imola because we don't have much free practice. We can't do back-to-back. Uh, sessions and really work it out but you've got a team like Mercedes that's desperate to find mm. stuff that, that works uh, perhaps we will see updates coming in um, but it is a tricky decision because unless you've got two two practice sessions and you've got that opportunity to really run the cars one with the new stuff one without I mean they maybe they can do that in FP1 I don't know but and particularly if Rachel says the weather forecast is bad that's a really tricky one it certainly is do, do you think um, we've seen this is the pecking order, Rachel. Do you think this is what, what it will be? Or do you still, still think we, we need to get to more European tracks to really see the true kind of pace of all of these cars? Um, no, I always like to go five or six races in before I actually try and make any sort of call on it, I think. Um, I want to see a variety of tracks. I want to see, I think we've got to bear in mind with this year as well, we had testing in Barcelona, then Bahrain, then they went straight from Bahrain test to Bahrain race, Bahrain race to Saudi race, Saudi race to Australia. So no one's really had a chance to get the new parts on these cars, to develop the new parts on these, because no one's really had a chance to bring their updates and actually work out if they work or not. So I don't think yet we can say that. Um, I definitely think Ferrari is strong and I think they'll continue to be strong. Then they say now they're not bringing upgrades to Imola, um, which is interesting. Don't know if that's, as you say, Ben, because there's no point because they actually can't do the back-to-back -back, um, correlations of them or whether or not they don't need them yet. I don't know. Uh, but I think Ferrari are definitely very strong. I think 
Red Bull's interesting. What is going on with this reliability? Because they say that they'd rather have a fast car than a reliable car. And Mercedes say, well, we would rather have a reliable car than a fast car because to finish first, you've first got to finish. But um, that's got to be a big issue. You know, this is two races in three now it's happened to Red Bull and they're not a team that usually struggles like this. So I definitely think Ferrari are ahead of everybody. And I think Red Bull do obviously have the second quickest car, but can they keep it on the track? That's the issue right now. So no, I think five or six races before I could make a call on the pecking order. Mm. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think I'd have to agree with you. I think everyone, well, people I've sort of spoken to recently think Spain might be the first kind of indication. And it usually is, isn't it? When people bring a new, a new package on the car. Um, well, with that in mind then, um, I think it's prediction time. Um, and uh, at the moment, um, Ben and I are just tired because there's always somebody who at least gets one point. So, uh, but no one's got it out right yet. No one's predicted it as, as it has sat on the podium, which is interesting. Um, and because uh, you're a guest this week, Rachel, you have the honour of going first. So you're one, two, three, please. And actually, perhaps for this weekend, we should say, who do you think will win the sprint race as well? And, and as such gets pole position. This is it. You see, I think, so I think, Char will qualify P1 for the sprint. I've got to get the wording right, haven't I? Yeah, yeah. Char will qualify P1 for the sprint, whatever it is. Um, he will, but Max will be P2 and Max will win the sprint. So Max will start P1 on Sunday. Okay. Um, but I think Char will win the race. And I think it'll be Char, Max, Carlos on the podium on Sunday. Okay. I like that. Strong lineup. Hard to hard to find any weak links in that. Ben, what are you going for? Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Um, I think uh, I think Red Bull and Max are going to be so focused on this weekend. I think I'm, I'm I I do agree. I think he's he's going to be up there, but I think, I think he may well get pole um, for the sprint race, and I think uh, he may end up winning it. I'm, I'm going to go with Max this weekend. I'm going to see that there might be, even though it's, we're in Italy and the Tifos, you want f- f- Ferrari to, to get this, you never quite know. And and I think, yeah, I'm going to go for Max for the win. Um, and I'll go for, um, I think I've got to go for Charles second. He's, he's just so, yeah, I think he's in that mindset now that he, if he's in a race where it's not actually coming together for him to win it, he's going to be in the mindset of second will do. I'm in the right place now. Um, and I'll go for um I'll go for Perez third this time. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna go over the opposite. Okay. I think Perez, I think he's due for a really strong weekend. I like an underdog, and I think he's a lot better with this car this year. And because the sprint's a lot shorter there's no pit stop drama obviously i think perez has got a decent shout of winning that and getting pole position and he performs well i think in in imola well he has done on on previous occasions front row last time yeah Yeah, exactly so and and it's not like he's been out of his depth so far so i think perez will get pole and then he'll go on to win it in front of leclerc (laughs) and i'm gonna put russell on the podium Ah. yeah i know wow be cool what happens to matt retired again, another, down again. Another <laughs> <Yeah. issue>. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing right you've got to get we've got i'm thinking tactically as well because you've got to try and get you've got to think different if you want the points so the, this is in our standings as well so uh, but okay. you'll be in the guest standings rachel so that's interesting so rachel verstappen on pole but leclerc wins it verstappen second science third ben way round, sorry verstappen uh, leclerc on pole verstappen wins the sprint oh okay and then leclerc wins on sunday okay other way around yeah, yeah got you, got you. Leclerc wins on Sunday. Okay, cool. glad we clarified that then. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, and then Ben. So you're thinking so Verstappen will be the winner of the sprint. Yeah, and then go on to win the. And then go on to win the race, and then Leclerc second, Perez third, and then I'm thinking it's Perez double bubble, and then Leclerc and Russell. Well. We will find out in a few days' time, won't we? Uh, thank you so much, Rachel Brooks, for uh, for joining us on the podcast and, and putting up with uh, a few of the technical glitches, if you noticed. Well, well done. Uh, but we'll act like it didn't happen. But thank you so much. Um, we'll be back same time next week to look back at everything uh, that Imola brings us. Uh, in the meantime, you can keep up to date with all the very latest on Crash.net. Uh, and as I say, uh, we'll be back here uh, next week, make sure you leave us a review, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts. Always lovely to hear from you. If you've got any questions, send them in. Just uh, tweet Instagram or Facebook us. Search Crash F1. Uh, and for myself, Harry Benjamin and Ben Edwards and Rachel Brooks. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>